Hello everyone. This is an updated video showing the features of the replacement firmware for the Web Relay Controller version 2.0. It's the one marked with HW-584. I usually call it a network module, so that is the terminology I will use in this video. There have been a lot of good user suggestions and collaboration from a couple of other developers that have significantly improved the firmware uh, from that that I had in the original videos. So we're going to walk through that. The reason I developed this firmware is because of the issues shown here. If you're watching, you probably already know about these problems. The replacement firmware fixes all this and adds a lot of other features. In this video, I'll show you the features provided by the new firmware, and I'll show you how to reprogram the device with the code available in the GitHub project. The GitHub project is at the URL you see here. The project includes a manual with additional detail on programming the device and using the firmware. If you don't need to see the feature demos, you can just jump ahead to the reprogramming steps. On the screen you see the t approximate time points in the video for those steps. Here's a quick overview of the firmware features and usage. First, let me mention that there are two versions of the firmware. The MQTT version is designed for use with MQTT and management products like Home Assistant, Node-RED, and similar kinds of things. The browser-only version is for use by users that only want a browser GUI without all the overhead of MQTT types of management. It's sort of a self-contained kind of approach to things using the browser-only version. The browser-only GUI includes a couple of additional browser-based features that are not included in the MQTT version of the firmware. I will demonstrate both of these. Here I assume the network module has already been programmed with the MQTT version of the firmware. For this demo I'm starting out with 16 relays attached since I think most people will use the network module that way. I usually only attach one to four relays but I'll use 16 in this demo. When I connect to the device, I get this screen, and I can turn relays on and off. Let me do just a real quick demo here. Just turn one on, save it, see the LED light comes on. I can turn several on, turn them off, and so on. Note that when I click a radio button, nothing happens to the relays until I click Save down here. I can click on Undo All before I click Save to undo anything I've changed. Let's say I've made some kind of complicated arrangement here and decide, oops, that's not what I meant. You just click on Undo All and the relays won't change states. Now if I click on Configuration, in this menu I can change the name of the module. The name is only to help you identify where the device is located when you log into it. This helps if you have several modules on your network. Note that the name also appears up here in the tabs. That way if you have several tabs open with several modules, you'll see the names across the top and you can go, more, go to them more quickly. I can also change the IP address, the gateway address, sometimes called default router, netmask, and the port number. I can also change the MAC address. Read the manual if you have concerns about what MAC address you should use. Important is just not to change this first part. It's got to have an even number in the first octet. If you change the IP address or MAC, you may need to close your browser, then reopen it, and connect it with the newly assigned IP address. Sometimes it can take a minute or so for your router to sort out the change in the MAC address so you might have to retry connecting a couple of times. If you make a mistake and just can't reach the device, you can reset it to the default address settings with the reset button that's on the board. You need to hold that button down for about 10 seconds. When the LED goes out, you can release the button. Of course, to reconnect with the module, you'll have to use the default IP address of 192.168 dot one dot four and port 8080 to reconnect after you've reset to defaults. If I make any changes, 
I need to click on save so that these changes are saved in EEPROM so that they won't be lost in a reboot or power cycle. There's also a few features you can select on this configuration menu. Full duplex. You should never need to use this, but it's available for some specific routers like Cisco business level switches. Look in the manual for details on full duplex. HA Auto enables Home Assistant Auto Discovery. Only check this if you're using Home Assistant. MQTT enables basic MQTT operation. Details are explained in the manual. You must enable MQTT if you're using Home Assistant, but you may be using a different MQT management device, something other than Home Assistant, in which case you'll probably only enable MQTT. This last item here, DS18B20. This enables use of IOPEN 16 to attach up to five DS18B20 temperature sensors. Again, details on this are in the manual. So there's a few more things you can enter. If you've enabled MQTT, then you're going to need to identify the MQTT server, or broker as it's sometimes called. So you need to enter its IP address and the port number that MQTT operates on. You have as an option to enter a username and password. Uh, I don't enter those on mine, but you can do that. You have to make sure that you set up your MQTT server or broker to understand those passwords. There's also a connection status display here. When you first start up the network module, these indicators will all be red, but they'll turn green one at a time as the connection is established with the MQTT server. They've all got to be green before anything will operate. I'm going to go ahead and reboot the module here, my module, to demonstrate a uh, connection with the MQTT server. So let me start the reboot. There's a short pause while the network module boots up. You can see that we've already got just the initial connection steps. That's an ARP and TCP operation. If I refresh a few times, we're going to see this progress in just a moment. Whoops. Well, it got through the remaining four during that last step. But this would indicate that we the network module is now connected with the MQTT server. So while we're on this menu, notice you can also configure each of the I.O. pins. You can identify each I.O. pin as a, an output or an input, or you can disable the pin. You may want to disable it so it doesn't clutter your browser or MQTT management display if you're not going to use that pin. If a pin is an output, you can also select whether the logic level of the pin should be inverted or not. This is so that an on condition in the firmware matches the pin state you need for an on condition in your hardware. This lets you correct for pin relays that have active high or active low trigger points. And finally, if a pin is an output, you can select the state you want it to be in after a power on or reboot. Here's how you do that. Retain means it should return to the state it was in before the power loss or reboot. On means it should be in the on state after a power loss or reboot. And of course off means it should be in the off state after a power on or reboot. You may think that you should always use retain, but I advise that you only use retain for outputs that change infrequently, perhaps only when you manually change the output, or if you're confident that whatever automation you set up will change the output only a couple of times a day. This recommendation is made to help reduce wear on the EEPROM. There is more detail in the manual. So let me change half of the pins to inputs and leave the other half as outputs. Of course, I've got to save for that to take effect. And now I'll go look at the I.O. control page. Now you can see half of them are inputs, half of them are outputs. 
Now let me pause the video for a moment so I can reconfigure the hardware and st demonstrate the input pins. So now I'm going to ground that input pin. If I click on refresh, you can see that it's on. Now why is ground on? Because back in configuration, we had it inverted. If I uninvert it and save, go back to the I.O. control page, now ground is off. If I remove the ground, and refresh, it's on. So that's how invert works on the input pins. So now let's go back to the configuration page and we're going to enable the DS18B20 sensors. I'll pause for a moment and add those in the hardware. And now I will save that new configuration change. And now if I go back to the I.O. control page, the temperature sensors have been added. Notice that output 16 disappeared. That's because that I.O. pin is now being used for these temperature sensors. Likewise, if I go back to configuration, I see that output 16 is disabled. So it's not really disabled. It's being used for the temperature sensors, but it's disabled as an input or an output. Let's go back to the I.O. control page for a moment. You notice that the temperature sensors have a rather long set of digits for their ID. The temperature sensor IDs are generated from the 48-bit temperature sensor serial number that is uniquely encoded in each DS18B20 sensor. The sensors are identified this way so that they will retain a unique ID in the browser and in MQTT managers like Home Assistant. Now let's take a look at what this looks like in Home Assistant. Here's the display of the device we were just looking at. You'll notice there's eight inputs, eight outputs, well, seven outputs, <laughs> and then the temperature sensors. Same serial numbers are displayed. In my case, I have the uh, Home Assistant set up to display temperatures in terms of degrees Fahrenheit. Now if I come along and I turn an output on. You can see that it turned on in the uh, relay. The little relay light is on right here. And likewise, if I now jump back to the browser and refresh the display, we see that the relay is on here. Also note that if I turn it off in the browser display and now go back to Home Assistant, it turned back off over here. So any information that's appearing in the browser likewise appears in Home Assistant. So that's a basic demonstration of the MQTT version of the firmware, uh, including a sh demonstration of Home Assistant. You don't have to use Home Assistant. You can use other MQTT device managers instead. Next up, we'll take a look at the browser-only firmware. The point of the browser-only version is to provide users that don't want the complications of setting up an MQTT broker and a management system like Home Assistant. The users just want a simple device with a browser interface and perhaps a few extras like being able to name pins or have an output that when you turn it on it'll turn itself off after some interval. Many of the features in this version of the GUI are the same as the MQT version, so I won't repeat those. Instead, I'm going to focus on the features that appear only in this GUI. So here's the I.O. control page uh, for the browser-only version. Looks a lot like the MQTT version, but there's a little bit of a difference that I'll show you how it works in a minute. Notice the I.O. Uh, pin names here. So let's switch to the configuration page. The first thing you'll notice is that there are no MQTT server settings because we don't have MQTT in this version. And there's also no feature checkboxes for MQTT and Home Assistant right here. Otherwise, it's the same look as the MQTT version, at least in terms of this upper part of the configuration. Next, you'll notice that the pin definitions and configuration area is different. That's this right here. There's now a field where you can 
individually name the I.O. pins. I'll go ahead and name one, say, driveway lights. And I'll save that. Now if I go over to the I.O. control page, you'll see that that pin is now named driveway lights. Now back to the configuration page. If I now change the timer settings to 15 and the units to minutes, 15 and minutes, and I click Save, what will happen is that if I go to the I.O. page, the I.O. control page, and turn the driveway lights on. You've got to save it for that to take effect. In 15 minutes, they'll turn off again. We don't have time to wait 15 minutes, so let me go back and change it to like 10 seconds to demonstrate. Ten seconds. Save. Hopefully I can get over to I.O. control before 10 seconds takes place. Well, I saw the relay click off, so 10 seconds already passed. Let me go back to the configuration page and explain something here. Note that for this demo, the boot state is off for driveway lights. That tells the firmware that on timeout, you want the lights off. So if you want the reverse of that, you should set the boot state at to on. Of course that means that the driveway lights are normally on and if you turn them off you want them to turn back on again. I think this is more easily understood by playing with it a little. Okay that's really the difference between the MQTT browser and the browser only version and you might ask why can't I have these features in the MQTT browser version of this thing? Well the features won't fit in the space available in the firmware and if you think about it, you can do all of this in Home Assistant or similar MQTT-based device managers anyways. So this feature was really added for people that don't have MQTT, don't have Home Assistant, but they want a little more controllability just through a browser. There's one final feature of the browser-only version you might be interested in. Um, if you go to the URL bar and enter 68 after the slash. Now let me press enter. You get this network statistics page. This page shows all the network statistics collected by the web server on uh, the module. You'll see lots of dropped and received packets on the device uh, as the device receives and rejects packets that are meant for other devices on the network. You'll also see a count of ICMP packets if you ping the device and received and set TCP segments if those packets are addressed to the device. And if you attempt to contact the device, say using the wrong port number, you see sends for closed ports and TCP reset segments. In general, the other counts seldom show anything unless there is some significant network activity occurring. Uh, the network statistics page is useful for diagnosing network problems and or making sure that the device is really working reliably. Uh, note that the page does not update dynamically. It takes a snapshot when you access the page and will update the next time you access the page or if you click on refresh. And you can clear the counters with the clear button down here. Again, look at the manual for more detail. I don't think network statistics really gives you much. It might come in handy. Doesn't fit in the MQTT version, only in the browser only version. Um, but it's kind of cool, so since there was a little room in the browser version, I went ahead and added it back in. Let's go back to the I.O. control page and take a look at how REST commands work. Um, I call them REST commands. They probably really don't exactly fit the REST uh, definition but they're pretty close. They're available in both the MQTT and browser-only versions of the firmware. 
So I'll input a few REST commands so you can see how they work. All of these are described in the documentation and the help pages. Uh, let's say I put in I put in 0, 0 and I press enter. What that would do is turn uh, the driveway lights off or pin 1 off. If I put in a 1, it turns pin 1 on. I can do this with all of the individual relays. If I put in 55, it turns them all on. 56 turns them all off. Um, this is kind of handy mostly in testing and setting up your system. Uh, for instance, you may have you may turn them all on like that and then via the browser maybe turn a couple of them off. So kind of handy for that kind of purpose and also handy if you're writing your own application that may want to use browser type commands or UR, URL type commands to turn things on and off. Uh, there's also a simplified page of the status of all the pins. Put in 99, press enter, and I get this little row of numbers which indicates uh, from starting with IO1 through IO16 what the state is, regardless of whether it's an input or output, it will tell you whether that pin is in the on state or the off state. Let me go back to 60, which happens to be the IO control page. So, brief demonstration for the REST commands. This part of the video shows how to reprogram the device with the new firmware. A note before you get started, reprogramming the Web Relay controller or network module uh, requires turning off the readout protection bit on the device. This will erase the program currently in the device. It will only work again after you successfully reprogram it, so do this at your own risk. I've reprogrammed about a dozen of these and my development devices have been reprogrammed hundreds of times. So I think the process is fairly safe. This is a note on where you can buy these modules. Just be sure you get the version 2.0 module, not the V.1 device. Uh, you're probably watching this video because you already bought the device and found the firmware on it to be pretty much useless. So let's move on. You're going to need an ST-Link V2 programmer. You need one of these to interface your PC or laptop with the network module's programming port. They're fairly cheap at about three to six dollars depending on where you buy it. Look for one that comes with a four pin cable if you don't already have that. Uh, you can find them on eBay and similar websites. You're also going to need a four pin header, solder, and a soldering iron of some kind. Again, eBay is a good source. And now let's go look at uh, getting the free software from uh, STM or ST Microelectronics. All of my development work was on the Windows OS, so that's my focus here. You'll need to download the ST Link driver and the combined ST Visual Develop and ST Visual Programmer software. I'll use the document in the GitHub repository for quick access to the links. First up is to download the driver. That's what we'll get right here. And next is to download the software. Since I already have these installed on my computer, I won't demonstrate installation, but my recollection is that it's straightforward. Install the driver before you plug in the ST-Link device. And now let's get the binary images for programming the device. So I recommend that you create a directory like you see here in your documents uh, directory. Of course your username won't be Mike, so uh, you'll, well, unless your name is Mike, so you'll put your own user ID in there. But otherwise, uh, try to follow the same naming convention for the documents directory. Um, this will be important to you later on should you decide to install the Cosmic compiler and uh, maybe make changes to the code for yourself. And all of my uh, work is based on having the directory set up this way so uh, that will help reduce the number of nuances that you see. 
you won't need the Cosmic software, uh, which is a compiler, if you're just going to program your device. But it's good to set up the directory for it just in case. So this is the GitHub site uh, that we'll be going to. This is the website you'll see. Go to the releases part of GitHub over here. And you'll find all the prior releases. Plus you'll find the current release. This will probably have changed by the time you see this video, but at the current release will be the one at the top. You can click on any of the files that you want to download and the files will end up in your download directory. In this case, I'm just going to collect all four files for the uh, MQTT version and the browser only version and you simply click on them they get downloaded to your downloads directory we'll jump over there and take a look downloads there they are. So what you'll want to do is copy and paste those files and paste them into the documents directory you created just a moment ago. So we got all the software and firmware ready. Let's turn our attention to the hardware. First is adding a pin header to the network module for programming. It's fairly simple. I'm just going to demonstrate soldering on the 4-pin header for programming, but you can also add uh, 20 pin I.O. connector at this time. I'm not showing that because you have a lot of options in terms of adding a male or female header, straight pins or 90 degree pins, and your application may want the connector on the top of the board or the bottom. Sort of up to you and how you're going to use the device. I'll go ahead and speed this video up so you don't have to watch all my soldering steps and so that you don't fall asleep. Now that the header is soldered on, let's connect an Ethernet cable to the PC or laptop. I recommend directly connecting the PC or laptop to the board you're reprogramming for initial, initial setup. Now let's connect the ST-Link cable to network module. Here's the diagram from the GitHub documentation. Notice the wires are not straight across from the ST-Link to the network module header. They're shifted down and the last one wraps around to the top. So pay attention to this when connecting the cable. You'll see me connect them that way in the video. Now that we're hooked up, I'll reach down and power on the network module. My power switch is off screen. That's done, and now we go on to actual programming. In this video, I'll program a module with the MQTT version of the firmware. Important to note before programming is that the factory fresh modules have their firmware protected with the readout protection bit. This keeps you from reading the binary image on the devices, not that it's worth protecting. 
Anyway, we need to clear the readout protection bit to program the devices, and this will erase the program in the network module. Uh, that's the program that came from the factory. I caution that this erasure is at your own risk, but I can also say that I haven't had a single problem in hundreds of programming cycles. So here we go. First I'll start the STV programmer software. On my laptop I created a link to the program. It takes a moment to start. Once started you've got to select the STP file for the configuration you want. This is the navigation to that documents directory that you created earlier. Here's the STP file that I want for the MQTT version. It does take a moment to load, but once the binary image shows up, we have to clear the readout protection bit. This is done by selecting the Option Byte tab, this one. Note that the readout protection bit is off, which is what we want. We want it off, but we have to program the device to make it off in the device. So we'll click on Program, Current Tab. Obviously I had an error there from all of the programming I've been doing. So when that happens you just unplug the ST-Link module and plug it back in and now we'll try again. And it worked. The readout protection bit is now cleared and the device is erased. By the way, if you forget to clear the readout protection bit you'll get errors when you attempt to program new code. So if you see errors, come back and check that you actually program the device with readout protection off. Next, we'll click on the Program Memory tab. Then, click on Program and click Current tab. That actually programmed the device with the code that you downloaded from GitHub. If this worked, you should see the message Program Memory Successfully Verified in the Progress window down here. So that's all it takes to program the, the network module. In a moment we'll go on to configuring it, but there's an important note here if you are programming the browser only version. I'll quickly walk through all the programming steps again, this time using the browser only version of the, of the firmware so that I can show you the difference. So I'll go load the project for the browser only version. That would be this one. Now when I program the device there's a slight difference. I want to say program address range. and I want to use the range 8000 to FEBF. The reason I want to do this is because IO names and timers are stored in flash and you don't want to overwrite that area of flash. Now as it turns out, whether you're programming the MQTT version or the browser only version, you can follow these steps. It's just a little easier not to have to remember to do this if you're using the MQTT version. So I click on OK. It will program the device just in that range that I selected, which leaves our IO timers and IO names area alone. So I just wanted to point that out to you. If you forget to do that and you program the entire flash, it will overwrite your IO names and IO timers. And so you'll see the default versions of the IO names and IO timers when you attempt to use the device. Obviously, you don't care if this is the first time you've programmed the browser-only version. But if you're coming back and updating the browser-only version, you kind of want to keep those timers and names uh, intact. Now that I've shown all that, I'll go back and reload the MQTT version to continue the demo. For initial configuration, I'm going to demonstrate how you would use, say, a laptop directly connected to the network module. Uh, the assumption here is that your network addresses don't match the default addresses of the network module. Um, 
But if your network uses IP addresses beginning with 192.168.1 and you know that IP address 192.168.1.4 is not already, already used on your network, um, you can skip this next part and just access this device using address 192.168.1.4 port 8080 directly connected to your network. Otherwise you'll have to do your initial configuration of the network module using a direct connect cable with your computer and uh, that's the procedure that I'll show you now. Now we'll communicate with it via the Ethernet port and change the default setup to one we want. So we disconnect the cable and first thing I'm going to do is verify that my laptop Ethernet port is set up to match the subnet range of the default settings of the network module. This is a quick demonstration of how to do that in case you've forgotten. First thing to do is to right click on your network symbol in the lower right, select open network and internet settings, select Ethernet, select change adapter options, right click on the Ethernet symbol, select properties, select internet protocol Four, version 4. Select Properties. Make sure use the following IP address is selected. Here I've selected 192.168.1.100 for my laptop so that I'm in the same subnet range as the default settings of the network module. Now I'm going to close all these windows to get them out of the way. After we get done with this initialization process, don't forget to come back to these settings and restore them to whatever you had before we made these changes. Okay, in a browser, let's enter the default IP address of the network module, which is 192.168.1.4 port 8080. Now we can set up the network module address settings to something that will work on the targeted network. So I'll click on configuration. I'll change my IP address to 182, just something I want. The gateway is already correct. Netmask is correct. I would like to use port 80. You got to choose a unique MAC address. I happen to know that one's unique for my network. If you you can really have any MAC address you want, just make sure this first octet is an even number, two, four, eight, so on, and that will work just fine. Last, I'll click on Save to establish those settings. Now you're going to notice if you wait, and I'll speed up the video a little so we don't wait all that long that the network module can no longer be seen. And the reason for that is its IP address is no longer 192.168.1.4. So in order to reach the network module, I'm going to have to change this to 182, which is what we programmed it to. Browsers will assume that the port number is 80 if I don't put one in, so that should work. And there it is. Uh, just a footnote, when you change a device IP address or MAC number, it can take a few seconds for your router or switch to remap the settings. So you might have to be a little patient, maybe 10 or 20 seconds, whenever you make address uh, setting changes. So let's go look and see if the address settings look right. Yep, they're exactly what we set. Now I can put the device on my network. It doesn't have to be directly connected to the uh, laptop anymore. And of course I'll have to go back and make sure I restored all my laptop settings. And that's it. If you have difficulties or find a bug or have improvement suggestions, leave a note on the YouTube site or the GitHub site or contact me at the Nielsen Projects email address that's in the documentation and on the GitHub site. I'll do what I can to help you. Thanks for watching.